Welcome to Animals Today, your home for serious talk about animals. I'm Dr. Lori Kirshner. I have to share with you a really tragic story that happened locally not long ago here in Palm Springs, California. Now, I know this is not the most uplifting way to begin a show, but there are some important points my guest today is going to make that dog guardians need to hear and think about. Today, we're going to be speaking about the risks at the dog park, the risk to both your dogs and to you. So what happened is this. In our city dog park, there are two areas, one small enclosure for small dogs, and then the much larger one for the medium and large dogs. Well, the guardian of a Chihuahua mix, for unknown reasons, let her dog run free in the large dog area. And the dog was attacked and killed by a Rottweiler. Now, I have to tell you, the Rottie had been going to the dog park a few days per week for years without incident. And in fact, I personally know this dog because he has accompanied his guardian, who is my patient to my office. This is a sweet an affectionate dog who would give me kisses and let everyone pet her. So look what happens. Something set her off at the park. She goes after a dog who should have not been in there and kills him. And before you know it, the owner of the Rottweiler is summoned to court. So to avoid that, what he did was relinquish the dog to the shelter and who knows what happens then. So I would say that this could have been avoided and the owner of the small dog should be held responsible for the attack. But let's hear from a real legal authority on this. I wanna welcome back to the show, attorney Kenneth Phillips. Ken is a nationally renowned expert in the law pertaining to dog bites, and is very interested in what happens in and around dog parks. Welcome back to the program, Ken. It's good to be here, thank you. So Ken, what are your initial thoughts when you hear what happened to this little dog? There was no common sense on the part of the owner of the Chihuahua. I mean, I, I feel my heart is broken to hear about this accident because I owned a little Yorkie uh, myself, and I was always worried about it. But, you know, to let the dog into the area of the park where the big dogs were was something that legally is referred to as assumption of the risk. Assumption of the risk is basically when you're consenting to being injured, and that's really what went on there. So, you know, this is a this is one of those owner operator errors that we we see so often when there are uh, tragedies involving dogs. Now, people and dogs really like dog parks, Ken, and generally they are considered desirable community assets. But as this event shows, there are risks involved in visiting them. Do people judge the magnitude of these risks correctly? Well, I don't think that they do. I, I think that there are that just like in any other field, there are people that are more aware and there are people that are less aware. So you have people going to dog parks that, first of all, understand what the risks are. They understand where their dog should be. They look, they watch the dog while it's out there playing to make sure no bad situation is developing. They, they have their dogs on a leash, bringing them in and out of the dog park. So they're following the rules they're doing the right things, but then you've got the other people, and those are not only uh, they can be people that are unreasonable in terms of how they're behaving at the dog park. They can also be people who are bringing too many dogs into the dog park. So there, you know, there's a mix of people, and and you just have to keep your eye open. The bottom line is that dog parks they're great, they're good for the dogs, they're good for the people, but they are not necessarily the safest place for every dog right some dogs are just not suitable to go to the dog park right i mean what characteristics in a dog don't mix well in dog park well you can't bring a female in heat uh you should not bring an aggressive male dog and if you have a dog that is uh timid to about being around other dogs timid to the point that it feels that it has to defend itself or a dog that wants to always fight with other dogs, you should not bring that dog to the dog park. You should not be training that dog, using other people's dogs to socialize your own dog. You have to use common sense. You must not expose other people's animals and pets to risk 
by your own dog. So, yeah, those, those types of dogs are, are not the right dogs for a dog park. We've spoken about the people and the dogs, and I want to talk about the parks themselves. But first speak a bit about the law, Ken, where responsibility lies for avoiding accidents and bites and fights, and who or what is potentially liable for these incidents. The, the rules of liability in a dog park are exactly the same as outside the dog park, with only one exception, and that is that a leash is not required. And if you look at it that way, you'll understand the whole legal concept of the dog park. The other thing to keep in mind is that there, there is no extra protection for you in the dog park. In other words, if something happens, you can't go to the city and say, well, you owe me money because it's your dog park and my dog was killed or my dog was injured and there was a $5,000 vet bill. You, you can't do that because the dog park is a recreational area set up by the government. And as such, you can't bring any kind of a claim because that's what the law is for recreational areas set up by the government. So if you, if you understand that it's exactly the same set of laws as anywhere else, except that you have the uh, no, you know, you can get by without a leash, number one. And, and number two, you are assuming a certain amount of risk walking in there. That's the basic legal framework. Are dogs supposed to be free from transmissible disease and have current vaccinations to be allowed to go to dog parks? This is one of those common sense uh, things that you, you wish that people would keep in mind. And there's a whole range of, of these things. Of course, they should be free of disease. Uh, when, they, when they're when they brought into the dog park, just like they should be free of those other traits that I mentioned a second ago. And, and, they, and many dog parks will post rules. And, you know, when you violate the rules, there's another layer of, of uh, it's not law, but, but let's say it's regulation. And that is, if there are rules posted, you do have to follow those. So that does become part of part of your obligation. Many of the dog parks do post uh, a a notice that the dog has to be free of, of anything that that any kind of transmittable disease or illness. How common is this, Ken? Where where a dog hurts another dog at a dog park? I hear about these things all the time because on the on my website dogbitelaw.com, I have always been open for people to send me email and ask me questions and tell me about what's going on. So every day I'm hearing about some dog getting injured in a dog park. Usually it's a, it's a situation where it's a, you know, it's a smaller dog. Uh, I also hear about people getting injured in dog parks. They get, you know, uh, they get involved in breaking up a fight between their dog and another dog. That's how it usually happens and somebody gets bitten in the process. You can get bitten by your own dog if your own dog is, is trying to defend itself and is in a panic. So I, I, do hear about, I do hear about accidents every day in dog parks. So let's talk about the dog parks as facilities. What makes a good dog park from a legal and safety perspective, and what are important deficiencies? One of the most important things is where is it located? You, you want to locate the dog park in a place where there is a sufficient parking. You want it to be downhill as opposed to uphill because of the runoff. You know, when there's, when there's rain and when they, when they turn on the sprinklers for the grass, the, the water takes whatever is in the dog park and can run it down into the neighborhood. You don't want that to happen. Uh, you want there to be uh, adequate fencing. You want there to be double gates so that, you know, the dogs can't just run out when somebody new comes into the dog park. You want it to be at a sufficient distance from residential, uh, from homes and, and even from schools because of the barking and, you know, just the general distraction that, that can occur as a result of the, uh, the dog park being there. So the, these are some of the things that have to do with location. Then after that, you want to have something like a, a committee that is responsible for that dog park. You want some, some people that you can actually talk to, not, not just a sign that says this is what you're not supposed to do and this is what you are supposed to do, because there should be somebody that can 
that can help supervise what's going on at that dog park. And I, and I don't mean just supervise the conduct of the people that are using the dog park, but also things like are, are when the dogs dig holes, are the holes being filled in? Are there, is there enough access to water? Are the water, uh, the water fountains and spigots working? Uh, are the benches clean? That type of thing. So, so a, a good dog park, uh, there's planning with regard to the location, and then there should be people that are part of a committee or, or some other such thing that are actually paying attention to what's going on and making sure everything's clean and neat and hospitable for everyone who's using it. Very good. Don't go away. More with attorney Kenneth Phillips. He's the author of DogBiteLaw.com. We're talking about dog parks. You're listening to Animals Today. I'm Dr. Lori Kirshner, and your Animals Today Minute for today is about hummingbirds. These delightful diminutive flyers comprise more than 300 species with a range from southern Alaska to southern Chile. Thanks to their unique figure of eight pattern of wing flapping, hummingbirds can move in precise, quick movements, including backwards and upside down flight. Hovering by a flower permits their long, specialized tongues to reach the flower nectar before darting off to the next meal. And depending on the sugar content of the nectar, hummingbirds may consume up to their own weight of it each day. Less preferred foods include tree sap, pollen, and insects. But a lot of energy is required to sustain their metabolic rate, which is the highest of any warm-blooded animal. Their name, of course, comes from their characteristic sound produced by the rapidly flapping wings, measured at up to 80 beats per second. The smallest hummingbird, the bee hummingbird, can weigh less than 2 grams. That's less than a penny, and most weigh less than 5 grams. It's easy and fun to attract hummingbirds to your garden with easily available feeders and sugar solution. But here's a tip. They often get stuck in open garages after being attracted to the red color of the door's emergency release cord's handle. Their natural instinct to fly upwards to safety rather than horizontally out the opening can tire these little guys out. But by painting the handle a different color than red or wrapping it with black electrical tape, the birds won't wander into the garage. And that's your Animals Today Minute for today. Welcome back to Animals Today. I'm Dr. Lori Kirshner. We're speaking to attorney Kenneth Phillips about dog parks. Ken, what are your pet peeves when it comes to people using the dog park? I think that that one of the worst things, that, one of the things that bothers me the most is that when a person is just uh, really the wrong person for the dog park or they're bringing in the wrong kind of dog. Now, I'll tell you what I'm thinking of specifically. You could have a dog walker who is using the park, and they're using it commercially for their business, and they're bringing in too many dogs. Mm. So it's not it's not as though we as as taxpayers want to support that because we're supporting somebody in their business. I don't think dog walkers with a lot of dogs should be bringing them into the dog park. I think there should be a top limit of, of let's say, three dogs for a dog park. And then similar to that, you've got the the uh, the obedience trainer who comes into the dog park or and is trying to you know train a dog there. Don't do that there. That's not really what it's for because it's just not fair to everybody else. And then speaking of what's unfair to other people, you've got underage kids, in other words, who bring dogs into the dog park. A kid who can't control his dog should not be bringing that dog into the dog right. park. Similarly, on the other end of the scale, the elderly person who is making use of the dog park. I, I love the elderly. I'm getting that way myself every day. But I don't want somebody who is who can't control their dog to bring their dog into the dog park. Um, now, it, worse than that is the owner that drops off their dog and disappears. That's wrong because now there's nobody to watch that dog. Who's going to watch it? Everybody else? It's not our responsibility. So the owner who drops off the dog or doesn't watch the dog, I don't like. And speaking of owners, I don't go for I, not, even owning a dog if you don't have insurance. And I'm talking about either renter's insurance or homeowner's insurance. Both of those insurance policies usually cover 
accidents that are caused by your dog. But you have to check. You have to make sure that there's no exclusion in your policy. The way it works is if your policy doesn't mention anything about a dog, then you're fine. But if your policy mentions that it doesn't cover injuries caused by animals or injuries caused by dogs or injuries caused by your unpopular breed of dog, you got to change your insurance. So I'm, I'm completely against the, the owner who doesn't have insurance using that dog park because if something happens, who, who's going to pay? You know, the victim's going to pay. Right. Those are the main things that, that bother me in, in dog parks, the wrong people and, the wrong, and too many dogs. Ken, how do you categorize the clients you see? Explain to my listeners the, the elements of your practice. You know, there are three types of people that, that consult with me. One of them, of course, is the dog bite victim because that's the most serious, that's the most serious type of, a, of an incident between a dog and a person. But there are, there are two other things that I have gotten involved in that people don't particularly know know me for one of them is when the dog has been injured or killed in other words where you've brought your dog out for example and your dog is on a leash and some one or two dogs come running down the street and they uh, get in a fight with your dog and now all of a sudden you have to pay a thousand dollars or five thousand dollars in vet bills i wrote a book for that because this is a case that attorneys usually do not directly handle i wrote a book for that called when your dog is injured or killed. And that book is is available on my website, dogbitelaw.com. And then the third type of type of case that people bring to my attention is the case where their dog is being accused of being a bad dog. In other words, they've been summoned to dog court and they are now facing penalties themselves in terms of fines or restrictions on owning a dog in the future. And their dog is facing some kind of a, of a penalty like confinement or even being taken away from them, uh, like in the story that you told at the beginning of the show. So that is called, I, I wrote a book for that. It's called Defending Your Dog, Win Your Case in Dog Court. And, Lori, I, yeah, I'm not in favor of vicious dogs. I don't want anybody who has a vicious dog to even know about my book, but for people who who are summoned before the dog court and have to defend themselves because attorneys don't handle these cases directly because it's very expensive for the dog owner if an attorney gets involved. For people that are, are looking for justice and even people that have a bad dog of, but want to make sure that the sentence is commensurate with the crime, so to speak, those are the people that, that need this book. So those are the three things that I get consulted for. The dog bites, which is the main thing, and then when a dog is injured or killed and when a dog is being wrongfully accused. How do you define vicious? Well, vicious is, uh, that's a very good question because there's two different, uh, two different ways to define it. One, one way is the common sense way, which is that the dog, without any kind of uh, legal provocation, uh, goes after a person or an animal. That's that is the that's the common sense definition. And now notice that I said without a, a legal provocation. Right. There are people that will say that uh, oh you know the doorbell rang and that was provocation because it caused the dog to get startled and that's why the dog suddenly woke up and bit the little kid that was sitting next to the dog. That's not legal provocation. By legal provocation, I mean something like the dog was was uh, defending itself or the dog was somebody just hit the dog with something and the dog snapped at the person uh, so that's the common sense definition of a of a vicious dog then you have the, the a different definition which is when the authorities have summoned somebody into dog court because of some incident that has occurred and that incident in some in some cities can be as little as the owner was walking too many dogs, all right? They may summon the dog owner into dog court and then label the dogs as, as being vicious or dangerous under their code in that city. 
So, so you have two definitions. One is the common sense definition, and the other is you've been labeled. You know, your dog has been labeled a vicious dog. Kenneth Phillips, thank you for educating us about dog parks and what we need to be aware of. Ken is the author of DogBiteLaw.com and will answer your email questions free at kphillips at DogBiteLaw.com. You're more than welcome. It was a pleasure talking to you. This is Dr. Lori Kirshner from Animals Today. If you're like most people, you have lots of plans, a financial plan, an exercise plan, a career plan. You also need a plan for the care of your pets when you no longer can provide it. Every day, animals are sent to shelters, terrified and confused because their owners have become incapacitated or died. Unfortunately, many of them get euthanized. Good intentions sometimes take a backseat to life's realities, like a new spouse who doesn't like animals, a sudden desire to travel the world, or the adoptive caregiver's own illness. A legally enforceable pet trust offers the only assurance that your assets will be used as you wish to provide for the comfort and care of your cherished animal companion. Almost every state recognizes pet trusts. Find out how to create one today and take steps to make sure your pet doesn't risk becoming yet another sad shelter statistic. Plan for your pet's lifelong well-being. This message is brought to you by Advancing the Interests of Animals. Check them out at aianimals.org. Welcome back. Well, we are suffering another deep, cold winter, and we want to protect our pets, especially our dogs, from the cold so they can go out and maybe exercise, relieve themselves. Dr. Carol Osborne is with us today. She is a veterinarian based in Chagrin Falls, Ohio, a place I know well, and she is the founder and director of the nonprofit organization, the American Pet Institute, and she's going to talk to us about cold weather. Welcome, Dr. Carroll. Well, thanks for having me, Peter. Okay, so uh, cold weather and especially dogs, lots of hazards. So uh, what do we need to look out for? Well, um, when, when it gets cold, at least in this, in this neck of the woods, um, just I always tell my clients if it's too cold for you to walk outside barefoot, chances are it's too cold for your pets as well. So you need to use a lot of common sense. And when you get cold and you're ready to come in, uh, chances are the same theory would, would apply for your pets. I, I think it's good to remember that all the different ice melting products we use, rock salt, de-icing chemicals, and the like, um, are very irritating uh, to your pet's skin and paws. So you could spritz their feet off with a, a little bit of water when they come inside and pat them dry helps avoid you know irritation and chafing um certainly don't let your pet uh, ingest uh the different salt products and whatnot because uh that'll definitely cause cause a tummy ache and probably a little bit of drooling and depression yeah um as far as frostbite um it's the ears the nose the tip of the tail and the ears uh that are most sensitive um should should that happen, um, the tissue usually becomes a little bit red and then gray. Mm. So you want to give the pet a warm bath, wrap them up in some towels. Don't rub the area with frostbite and, you know, give, give your vet a call. And most of them recover and are, are certainly just fine. Yeah. Um, I don't know, Peter, does it snow out there in Palm <laughs> Springs? Is it? Are you guys uh, getting some of this cold weather? Oh, cold means I need to put on a single sweater. So it's quite mild here, but uh, there are mountains nearby, and occasionally we'll see snow on the mountains. And, and um, so it's not something we deal with directly here, but we've got listeners around the world. And um, even though the dog paws have those nice thick pads, they still are susceptible just to pure cold. So you want to protect them from that. That's what we're hearing there, right? Absolutely. Uh, I just... 
consider it going barefoot for yourself. If it's okay. too hot or yeah. too cold, okay. for you to go outside barefoot, the exact same principle would, would apply to your pet. They make all kinds of great booties these days. Um, and if you can find a pair that your pet likes, that's great. Uh, a lot of pets just don't care to have booties and things applied to their feet, yeah. in which case there are some different topicals. You know, rub a little bit on each of the paw pads um, that, that also work nicely to to help protect them from extremes of heat and or cold. Yeah. How about uh, doggy outerwear, like the jackets that are so cute? When should they be employed? And uh, I think I'm taking from your previous comment that they are okay, but won't protect from the tip of the tail and the nose being exposed. Yeah. yeah. You know, I, again, I, th- I think... Uh, it just depends on what kind of a dog you have. You know, if you've got a short-coated pet, uh, jackets and sweaters are wonderful. Uh, on the other hand, if, if you have a, a Siberian Husky, well, you know, the cold, the cold weather was, was made uh, for, for dogs like that. So pr- pretty much apply those concepts to yourself. Uh-huh. Um, if you uh, have a car parked in the garage or, or, you know, maybe outside on the curb, it's, it's a great idea to honk your horn and knock on the hood a couple of times because stray cats love to curl up in those warm engines to get a nice warm night's sleep. And that will uh, be great for any stray kitty that, that may have wandered uh, into your car's engine at night. And for anybody that might be uh, changing their antifreeze uh, or working with the radiator, uh, antifreeze is one of those things that is a true uh, life and death emergency, one teaspoon is, is all it takes, basically, to be fatal to a small dog or a cat. Yeah. So when you're working with your antifreeze, the pets should not be in the area. If you do spill a couple of drops, make sure you clean them up really well and then store those products up high out of your pet's uh, paw reach, which uh, brings me to uh, another topic, and that is um, all the different rat and mouse baits that many of us put out when the temperatures are a bit chilly. Uh, most of those baits have a, a peanut butter base, so they smell good, very attractive, mostly to dogs. Um, and if you think your pet may have gotten into a bait, uh, grab the container if time allows. Usually, um, if we can get the pet to vomit, um, you'll, you'll be in pretty good shape. But, you know, see your veterinarian. Sometimes we put them on a few days of vitamin K. Yep. And, um, and again, usually everybody recovers just fine, but it's always a, a good thing to just keep in mind. What should we have around the home, if anything, to induce vomiting in these emergencies as part of our sort of emergency kit? I think it's great to have a, a bottle of hydrogen peroxide around, but I also think that whether you call the ASPCA Poison Control Center or your local vet or your local pet ER, um, I think it's always good to check with a pet professional uh-huh. before you induce vomiting in any pet just to make sure that that is, in fact, the right thing to do. You know, I'm glad you brought up this idea about the uh, risks of antifreeze. You know, it's one of those things I've been... Uh, doing this show with Lori for more than a decade, or I think we're on our 13th year now. This is one of those things that comes up just all the time. And and I don't really have a good feeling of how common that I'm that is or whether it's sort of blown out of proportion. Sim- and I have this, I sort of categorize this along with the lilies and the cat toxicity. Are these like real hazards or are they, or are they sort of being blown out of proportion? Now, of course, you want to be careful and avoid it. But how commonly do we really see that? Uh, antifreeze is not uncommon. Yeah. Uh, there are two kinds. Of, for, you have to remember that it smells very sweet and sugary. Mm-hmm. Consequently, it's very attractive, again, primarily to dogs. Yeah. But a couple of licks, we have irreversible liver and kidney failure within the first 60 minutes. Wow. And that is why that in the vast majority of all cases, in my experience as well as research, they are universally fatal. Mm. Now, when it comes to lilies and it's Easter time, plants are more of a cat situation, and the cats like to chew on the leaves and play around with the plants, but uh, the lilies uh, are toxic to the kidneys of the cat, and they will put the kidneys into kidney failure. Um, And if, if, if that is promptly 
you know, picked up uh, and treated, then I think the odds are a little bit more in the cat's favor. The problem with plants and kitties is that in general, you know, mom and dad are out doing whatever they may do. So as far as do they directly see the cat, if you will, uh, eating or chewing a certain part of the plant, I think in most cases that that is not the case. What what happens is that in a certain amount of time, the kitty stops eating, gets sick to to its stomach, and then it takes several days to sort of pull the information out as to what might be an underlying cause. I had uh, that exact situation happen with um, with my hairdresser, <laughs> oh. to tell you the truth, Peter, and. Um, she did, in fact, have a lily in her home, which uh, it, it, it takes time to sort of dig this information out, if you will, because people just, you know, they just don't realize it. And even though the lily was still, you know, not really moved from its place by a process of elimination on what plants she did have in her home, that that's pretty much what we came down to. So... Um, if you have a lot of kitties in your home, silk plants, artificial plants, yeah. or plants that are placed up high away from your cat um, will work. But again, kitties, you know, they're pretty athletic, so they can jump uh, into places that your dog never could. So I think that a- you have to have different guidelines, if you will, for, you know, w- depending on what four-footed critters are living in your home. Yeah. Any other uh, parting thoughts on cold weather and dogs? Well, I think that cold weather can be a lot of fun uh, for people and their pets. Um, Dress your pet up warmly, protect their feet, and uh, just use a lot of good common sense. And I will also say that when it's really super cold, a lot of pets don't want to go outside to the bathroom. Mm. So issues of constipation, et cetera, um, become not uncommon at all you know shovel out a little path by whatever the door might be uh if you need to put a little tent or a little covering on it and try to make the area as friendly and happy as you can um so that your pet is in fact eliminating on a regular basis and you don't end up in your veterinarian's office great advice Dr. Carol, Dr. Carol Osborne from Chagrin Falls, Ohio. Uh, Where can people uh, learn more about you? Uh, We're online, uh, chagrinfallspetclinic.com, which is kind of a tongue twister. And we we also welcome uh, calls from pet-loving listeners all across the country. They can call us toll-free at 1-866-DR-CAROL, which is 866-372. Two seven six five. Okay, super. Thanks for coming on. Well, thanks for having me, Peter, and uh, I hope you guys stay warm out there. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Same back to you. Okay, more with animals today after this break. Every day in our community, countless animals are starved, beaten, and abused by people. And sadly, most of these cases go unreported and the abusers get away with it. And in many cases, someone knew about the abuse but did not report it. So if you see someone hurting an animal, or even if you just suspect something, call the police or animal control right away. Animal abuse does not just mean physically abusing an animal. Neglecting animals can be just as bad. So if you see your neighbor's dog being underfed, left without water, or tied up in the backyard without protection from the elements, it is important to report that too. In many cases, you don't even have to give your name and your phone call may save an animal's life. Also, we know that many violent and abusive adults got their start by first abusing animals. It's true, people who harm animals often turn their violence against other people and that is a cycle we need to break. Remember, animals can't speak out for themselves, so reporting animal abuse can save lives. This message is presented by Advancing the Interests of Animals. Visit them at www.aianimals.org. That's aianimals.org. Welcome 
welcome back to the show. So we don't talk much about bees on animals today, have we, Peter? It's been a while. They're very vital to our food supply. They certainly are. Yes. So, you know what's coming? Uh, a snack. <laughs> <laughs> I want to know how much you know about bees. Not much. Go ahead. You want your snack first? <laughs> I need energy. Okay. There are three types of bees in the hive. Name them. There are the drones. Yep. There are. There's the queen. Two. And there are the, the workers. Very good. Oh, yeah. The male bees are called what? Male bees are drones. Very good. Okay, let's stop there. <laughs> You getting hungry? I'm just going to take my 100% uh, results so far and just cash it in. Drones' only purpose in the hive is to mate with the queen. True or false? That Oh, uh, I guess that's true. That is true. Male honeybees serve only one purpose. They provide sperm to the queen. Mm. About a week after emerging from their cells, the drones are ready to mate. Once they've fulfilled that purpose, they die. So they die immediately after mating. It's okay if it works. It's only purpose of a male bee. <laughs> yes, I know. Okay. okay. Drones are not able to sting. True or false? That is going to be true. True. They have no stinger. Did you know that or no, is that a guess? That was a guess. That was good. Good guess. The lifespan of a queen bee is around two to three years. Peter, up to how many eggs per day does the queen bee lay? Five eggs, 250 eggs per day, or 1,500 eggs a day? Oh, 1,500. Yes. 1,500 eggs a day is correct. Without a queen, the colony will eventually die. Peter, regarding workers, all workers are female or male or a combination of both. Oh, oh gee. I'm going to say they are all male. They're all female. Uh, that's interesting. Number of worker bees in an average hive. is 30,000. 50,000 oh, or more okay. in a strong hive. Very good. Uh, okay. True or false, the bee will die if she stings. You know, I thought that was true my entire life, so I'm going to say true. It's true. Okay. How many eyes does a bee have? Oh. Two, four, or five? Oh, I'm going to say two, four, five. I'm going to say five. Five is correct. Oh, okay. <laughs> two with compound lenses mm -hmm. and three light sensors on top of their head. Oh, that's right. That's right. That's cool. How many wings does a bee have? And the answer is four? Yep, two okay. on each side. Okay. Bees make honey from? From from the uh, um, the nectar that they Yes. Get? The nectar from the from the flower? Yes. Oh, interesting. What gives a bee sting its ouch and its itch? Mm. Some I don't know, toxin? Yeah, it's toxin? some chemical called melatonin. Ah. Oh. How fast can a honey bee fly? Fifteen? <laughs> 30 or 60 miles per hour? I'm going to say 15 miles per hour. 15 is correct. Okay. Wings beat how many times per second? 50, 100, or 200 mm. times per second? I'm going to say I'm flapping right now to try <laughs> to simulate how fast that would have I to be. I see you flapping. I 200, don't think, 200. Yeah, you can't flap as fast as a bee. 200 times, is, 200 times per second is correct. Don't laugh at my methods. <laughs> they are the key to success. <laughs> You know, it's interesting, Peter, the frequent beats per minute contributes to the buzz we hear when they fly. Yep. How much honey does the worker bee make in her lifetime? One twelfth teaspoon of honey in her lifetime? One half cup or one cup? Oh, okay. Half cup. One twelfth wow, teaspoon that's, of that's honey. that's a lot of work. Yeah, it's a lot of work. How many flowers does a honey bee visit during one collection trip? Five to 10, 10 to 20, 50 to 100. Mm. How about 5,200? Yes, that's correct. Okay. It's an interesting, uh, tough life for these bees. Hope they're happy. Define happiness. Okay. No. Okay. okay. So, Peter, worker bees need to visit around 2 million flowers to produce a pound of honey. For honeybees, there's power in numbers. From spring to fall, the worker bees must produce about 60 pounds of honey to sustain the entire colony during the winter. It takes tens of thousands of workers to get the job done. A single bee colony can produce more than 100 pounds of extra honey, and this is what is harvested by the beekeeper. Okay, extra honey. Right. What is the name given to wine made with fermented honey? I don't know what kind of wine that is. Mead. Oh. Okay, well, you should know this. You know your liquors. What scotch liqueur is made with honey? Oh, uh, oh, I don't know. Drambouille. Oh, really? Have you ever had Drambouille? I don't remember. 
I don't remember. <laughs> is that a bad sign? <laughs> yes, it's a bad sign. <laughs> How many sides did each honeycomb cell have? Six. Very good. Uh, elementary. Geometry. How do honeybees communicate with each other? Oh, Release. No, I know they have this dance, right? Yes, they have a dance, which alerts other bees where nectar and pollen are located. Yeah. The dance explains direction and distance. Isn't that cool? It is very neat. The workers. How do bees stay warm and thus remain active all winter? Do they cluster for warmth? Do they hibernate? Or do they auto-regulate their body temperature? Boy, I'm going to say they cluster. That's correct. Bees do not hibernate, but do cluster for warmth. The honeybee is the only insect which produces food that is consumed by human beings. True or false? Oh, uh, I'm going to say that's false. There must be somebody eating something around that's the world. That's true. Yeah, well, well whole, like, you, no exceptions. Oh, well, okay. I mean, they might be eating stuff, but <laughs> normal human beings. Okay. Okay. How do honeybees build a honeycomb? I'll just tell you. Honeybees produce wax from glands located at the underside of their abdomen. They use this bees wax to build a honeycomb. Okay. And humans use this wax to make candles, of course, furniture polish and stuff like that. That's it. Okay. You did good. You did really good. Good guessing this time. Yes, I know. <laughs> Not about my liquors, okay? <laughs> don't know my li- I better study up on them. Drambui. I don't think I've ever had drambui. Well, okay, well, let's do some research on that. Okay. Thanks for tuning in. This is Dr. Lori Kirshner encouraging you, to, <laughs> encouraging you to nurture your love and compassion for the only other beings sharing our planet, the animals. Hi, it's Dr. Lori Kirshner with Animals Today. Today's Animals Today Minute is about giraffe hunting. Within the limitless grassy African plains lies the mighty giraffe, sharing its home with zebras, antelope, lions, cheetahs, and various other animals that make their home in the heart of Africa. These beautiful creatures face deforestation, agricultural conversion, and poaching. Their population has declined at least 40% over the past decade. Today, there are only approximately 80,000 giraffe left in the world. Giraffe numbers are shrinking, and their conservation status is vulnerable on the IUCN red list of threatened species, and the killing of these docile vegetarians continues. Besides the pressure of habitat loss, legal hunting and illegal poaching both occur. Giraffe trophy hunting tourism can be lucrative for the operators and can charge as much as $15,000 for a trip guaranteeing a kill. Illegal sport hunting is also reported to be prevalent. And poachers continue their own killing, seeking meat and coats primarily. Another factor contributing to the poaching crisis is the use of parts of the tail as a dowry to the fathers of prospective brides in certain cultures. The animals are literally being killed just to obtain the tail. And, as we've heard before, enforcement of wildlife protection laws is extremely challenging. So please check out the important work of Giraffe Conservation Foundation, African Wildlife Foundation, World Wildlife Foundation, and Wildlife Conservation Society to learn more and to see how you can help protect these gentle giants. I'm Dr. Lori Kirshner, and that was your Animals Today Minute.